Hello, welcome back to the Rooted to Truth podcast. I'm your host, Mackenzie Dickinson, and we are going to get into a very controversial discussion today, but I guarantee you it will be well worth the listen. If you've been listening in for a while, you'll be familiar with the fact that we are currently going through the Constitution, and today we are going to dive into Article 1, Section 9 to begin with, but our study won't end there. Oh no. We are going to venture into a few other articles in the Constitution as well because they're all there to complement each other and will help us unearth truth that has been buried in the trenches of agenda-driven rhetoric. In addition, we will go through some of the Federalist Papers because, well, a constitutional study just wouldn't be the same without it. The Federalist Papers were written so that people during that era could understand what the Constitution really had to say, and it serves the same purpose for us today. And of course, all of these things will be brought together using the Word of God, because His Word is the source of truth. I know you're probably saying, yeah, yeah, Mackenzie, come on, cut to the chase. What's this whole controversial topic about? Well, patience is a virtue, my friend, that's for sure, but I won't leave you hanging. On that note, let's get started. I grew up confused about something. And that is the truth about our founding fathers and what they thought regarding slavery. You know, in school, I mainly learned that there really isn't much to be proud of being an American citizen because apparently we have a shameful history, one filled with draconian practices and evil tyranny, a bunch of white supremacists ruling over enslaved people groups, being relentless in their treatment and having no care or concern in letting them go. But that's not true. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The history regarding our founding, the history regarding the framing of our Constitution, and the Civil War that was fought to repent of such things is a lot more honorable than most of us probably could ever imagine. And that's what I really want to talk to you about today. Because despite the fact that mistakes were made, The vast majority of our people fought to reverse and repent of national sins. Something I want to begin with is reflection on the story of humanity's fall, because it has a lot in common with the story of America's involvement in slavery. Because Adam and Eve sinned, we were all born into a sinful nature. It was handed down to us from the beginning, and the gospel message was sent forth to give us an opportunity to return to the Lord, to give our hearts over to Him, and lead different lives. And that is exactly how it went for the American people when they separated from Britain. See, Britain had force-fed slavery to the colonies. Evil likes to make you feel dependent on it and subservient to it. I mentioned this in my last episode But the English government had enforced a Navigation Act, which did a lot of different things, but in particular, the Navigation Act forced the colonies to practice and participate in the evils of slavery. And on many occasions, the colonists fought heavily against it. When the Navigation Act was passed in 1660, it prohibited American colonists from buying non-government approved merchandise from ships coming into ports, and it mandated receival of whatever cargo came into the ports. A regulation that, if broken, would result in a lack of funding or other economic sanctions upon the colonies. Colonies such as Virginia did try to ban slavery, but their efforts only resulted in threat of complete economic halt. England wasn't afraid to cut off trade and starve the people into obedience. So, my point being here is that the infant stage in America's founding was subjected to sinful ways. But an overwhelming movement towards change was in the hearts and minds of the colonists. Sadly, the overwhelming clamoring voices in our culture seem to sing a different song. One that claims America's founders 
were just a bunch of rich elite white men that wanted to use and abuse innocent men and women of foreign cultures in order to make a profit. I don't know about you, but if I'm honest with myself, there have been times in the past where I felt so ashamed to even talk about the slave trade because my public school education sold a slanted version of history to me. But that timidity stops today. And if you have at all felt the same way, I hope this episode will give you encouragement to be bold in proclaiming truth as well. I started getting into my studying for this episode and asked myself two really crucial questions. Number one, how did the slave practice change over time? And two, who were the slaves that first entered into this nation? To answer the first question, indentured slavery was the primary form practiced in American colonies, meaning that people chose to go into an environment as a slave to pay off their debts and would not act as a slave indefinitely. There are many cases where men and women were set free once their debts were paid off. For example, an African-American man by the name of Anthony Johnson was living freely in the colony of Virginia in 1651. He even acquired 205 acres of land and contracted five indentured servants of his own. There's one you don't hear often. (laughs) A former slave owning slaves? Ironically, when one of his servants' service was about to expire... Johnson would not let him go, so Johnson's neighbor ended up buying the servant and then set him free. In a court trial, it was concluded that despite having been set free, the servant, named John Kaser, was still a slave to Johnson for life. Need I point out that the trial was not under the American government's authority, but was still under Great Britain. It's ironic to me that a man, once a slave, was given freedom. Enough freedom to go out and have land of his own and slaves of his own, and yet he did not show the same grace to a man that was in the same position he once was in. And to answer the second question, the institution of slavery didn't begin with African slaves in America. It wasn't until the late 17th century that America received its first African slaves. Like, there was literally no African slave market until the late 1600s. Before the African slaves were ever brought to America, foreign trade ships would bring them to the Bermuda Islands. It was not American trade ships that brought African slaves into this land. The vast majority of America's slaves at the beginning of the practice were actually European, European slaves were less expensive because they did not live as long and they had less of a journey to get to America. After answering these questions, I started to think, well, historically, we have seen tension between ethnicities. So what was it like in the colonies? If there were both European and African slaves during the late 17th century, how did these slaves treat one another? I found the history of the New York Slave Revolt in 1712 to be particularly insightful on this topic. The Slave Revolt of 1712 was a unified revolt where both European and African slaves united to take a stance for freedom. The government presiding over the colonies at this time was still Britain, and in order to quench the tensions of the slaves, Britain enacted laws on the European slaves, that were more oppressive than those on the African slaves. Their goal in doing this was to create a racial divide between the two groups so that no unification would threaten to overthrow the governing system and that slavery would never be abolished. It's funny to me, though, because the 1712 revolt is actually one of the things that led to the 1776 Declaration of Independence, where the Americans made a promise to fight for the independence of all men. And that's another thing I want to hone in on for a moment. In the Declaration of Independence, it says that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. 
Among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if our founders were really so racist, don't you think that they would have openly stated their racist worldviews in the Declaration of Independence? I mean, personally, I think it probably would have said something more along the lines of, all white men are created equal, if that's really what they believed. But that's not what was said. Also, I'm sure you've heard this one, but Thomas Jefferson is one of the most demonized founders for having personally owned slaves. And he is the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence. I looked into him a little bit so that I could understand what his views actually were regarding slavery. And you know what I found? I found quote upon quote of Jefferson telling his listeners just how greatly the slave trade burdened his spirit. He said, I can say with conscious truth that there is not a man on earth who would sacrifice more than I would to relieve us from this heavy reproach. He said, there is nothing I would not sacrifice to a practicable plan of absolving every vestige of this moral and political depravity. It is a hideous blot. These quotes were surprising to me considering all my life I had heard that Thomas Jefferson owned slaves and was heavily involved in the practice. But did you know that Thomas Jefferson did not purchase any of his slaves? He inherited every single one of them and he did not free them right away because he knew that he was going to take care of them in a way that others may not if he were to let them go during a time where it was not safe to do so. Oh, and what's really incredible is that Jefferson made his slaves shareholders. Once I started analyzing these things and started asking myself questions that would cause me to think critically, I began to see holes penetrating through the curtain hung by our educational institutions. But there was one other question that was running through my mind, and that was, Why did we take so long as a nation to do something about slavery if the founders hated it from the start? And that is probably the greatest question I could have asked myself because the answer I found really does show the heart of our founders and it shows the honor and thought that went into the framing of our constitution and the founding of our nation. It's easy to criticize people's actions, but if we are actually to uncover truth, sometimes we must begin by analyzing ourselves. So I asked myself, Mackenzie, you could easily criticize the founders by saying they didn't abolish slavery right off the bat, but when you were overcoming a problem in your life, how long did it take you to overcome it? When people have addictions or any other type of dependence upon something outside of the Lord, it takes a while for those bad habits to be broken and for the wrong to be made right. Change doesn't happen overnight with an individual, and it certainly does not happen overnight for a nation. There was so much on the line for our infant country. If they had taken any radical steps towards abolishing a system that so many had become accustomed to, that would have been a weakening from within, and America's enemies could have easily come in and infiltrated, washing freedom from the face of the earth completely. In the framers' eyes, a few years of patience and slow progression towards abolition was a better choice than a rash jettisoning that would only inevitably result in the removal of freedom altogether. So on that note, I want to take you into some of the founding documents. I'm sure you've all heard about the three-fifths clause and some of these other historical sources that are used against the founders to display a false narrative of their intentions. But instead of just going along with the culture's interpretations, I want to get into what the documents actually have to say word for word, because that is where we will unearth truth. So hang tight as we jump into our constitutional study. Even though in 1787, the Constitution did not blatantly ban slavery in America, certain clauses were written so that slavery would be discouraged, and that a deadline would be set on when federal action could be taken upon the matter. 
So Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 talks about the year 1808. What was so special about 1808? Well, during the Constitutional Convention, the large majority of the delegates wanted to quickly eradicate slavery. But two key states in particular were in great opposition. Those two states being Georgia and South Carolina. The delegates from South Carolina and Georgia threatened to be separate from the new nation. And if we look at geography, we can see how detrimental that move would have been. If the two key slave states being South Carolina and Georgia had been excluded from the new nation, then most likely New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey would have taken the same side. And geographically, the nation would have been split with a slave nation on both sides and a free nation in between. And that free nation in between would have easily been infiltrated with slavery. That sort of conflict with a new and fragile nation would have been horrible. The British crown would have come in like a roaring lion seeking freedom to devour. If Britain had been able to go in and take over during a time of national unrest, slavery would have been established as a mandate forever. To support what I'm saying here, I'd like to read you a quote from Justice James Iredell, a delegate from North Carolina during the Constitutional Convention. He said, It is the wish of a great majority of the convention to put an end to slavery immediately, but the states of South Carolina and Georgia would not agree to it. Consider then what would be the difference between our present situation in this respect if we do not agree to the Constitution, and what it will be if we do agree to it. If we do not agree to it, do we remedy the evil? No, sir, we do not. For if the Constitution be not adopted, it will be in the power of every state to continue it forever. They may or may not abolish it at their discretion, but if we adopt the Constitution, the trade must cease after 20 years, if Congress declare so whether a particular state pleases so or not. Surely then we can gain by it. That was the utmost that could be obtained. I heartily wish more could have been done, but as it is, this government is nobly distinguished above others by that very provision. Where is there another country in which such a restriction prevails? We therefore, sir, set an example of humanity by providing for the abolition of this inhumane traffic, though at a distant period. As Mr. Iredell was saying here, there was so much on the line, and that is exactly why it was fundamental that the Constitution be specific in verbiage and that it be agreed upon by all the states, no matter how different their opinions were. If you'll remember, the whole reason for the Constitutional Convention was to do away with the disunifying Articles of Confederation that would have given states the freedom to practice slavery for as long as they thought reasonable. If the Constitution had not been signed and ratified, who knows where we would be? You know, a little while back, I had read in some article that the National Archives are deeming the Constitution as being a hateful document. But on the contrary, our Constitution was the stepping stone that allowed for abolition to take place in our nation. So let's read Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1, and then we'll dive into the three-fifths clause found in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3. So Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the Constitution says that the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation. See, there we have key pieces of evidence. First of all, I'd like to point out that it says importation of such persons. That is a example of what the majority of the founders thought of the slaves. They did not see them as property, but they called them people. 
And although the Constitution here still gives a window of opportunity for slavery to be practiced in America, the migration and importation of persons was not to just be allowed into any state, but in particular, it says the states now existing. It says states now existing because the founders agreed to wait 20 years for abolishing the trade so long as slavery was contained in the already practicing regions. For example, in 1789, the added Northwest Territory was banned from allowing slavery. And in 1794, there was a ban on the exportation of slaves out of the United States into any other nation. They wanted to make sure that the slaves stayed within the borders of the United States because of their plan to emancipate them in the near future. So the clause that talks about no action being taken until the year 1808 was established as a temporary element of the constitutional structure, which only applied to the states existing during the time. See, if we reflect back on the powers given to Congress in Article 1, Section 8, we will find that Congress has the power to regulate trade. The states that were fighting for the slave trade to remain were afraid to agree to the Constitution if no clause was implemented to prohibit Congress from doing away with slavery altogether right off the bat. If there was no clause of restriction, Georgia and South Carolina delegates would have pushed for an exclusion of the two states from the Union. As a way to persuade the states to not practice slavery, the clause allowed for a tax to be placed upon any importation of slaves. Trust me, putting this clause into the Constitution was a very strenuous and painful thing for many of the anti-slavery founders to agree to. But even James Madison in the Federalist Number 42 said that it would be doubtless to be wished that the power of prohibiting the importation of slaves had not been postponed until the year 1808, or rather that it had been suffered to have immediate operation. And he continued, It ought to be considered as a great point gained in favor of humanity, that a period of 20 years may terminate forever within these states, a traffic which has so long and so loudly upbraided the barbarism of modern policy, that within that period it will receive a considerable discouragement from the federal government and may be totally abolished by a concurrence of the few states which continue the unnatural traffic in the prohibitory example which has been given by so great a majority of the Union. Something he said really hit me, though, because it is one of those prophetic statements just like Hamilton gave us in our last discussion that really reflects the culture of this era. He said, Attempts have been made to pervert this clause into an objection against the Constitution by representing it on one side as a criminal toleration of illicit practice. I mention these misconstructions not with a view to give them an answer, for they deserve none, but as specimens of the manner and spirit in which some have thought fit to conduct their opposition to the proposed government. That's exactly what people in our era are doing today. They're perverting the causes to boost their objections against our Constitution and claim that our nation is founded on a criminal toleration of an illicit practice. At the foundation of their claims is a desire to dismantle the American system and do away with the history which is so evidently laced with honor, valor, and biblical principle. I truly hope you're beginning to see the ways in which the culture has been completely wrong about our founders. At this point in my studies, I started to think, Okay, well, I see how the mainstream message is wrong in a lot of ways, but I'm still a little confused about this whole three-fifths clause thing because it seems pretty difficult to explain that one. But let me tell you, once I actually studied and understood for myself the original intent, I got so excited, but also so saddened because I know that they do not teach these things in school, and it should be mandatory because I can guarantee you 
Our nation and our culture would look a lot different if people actually understood our history and were able to look at it as a learning experience in addition to looking at it as inspirational. So hang tight, when we get back, we're going to get into the three-fifths clause. Do you know what the three-fifth clause says and why it was written the way it was? I'm sure if you're like me, the picture painted for you showed that the three-fifths clause counted African slaves as three-fifths of a person because the founding fathers were too stubborn to recognize the value in the individual and that the issue was quickly addressed and given very little attention by the delegates. I personally was never given a backstory or a logical explanation as to why the clause was written the way it was. And now that I reflect back on being taught these things, you know, it's funny. I cannot recall them ever reading to me the actual clauses from the Constitution. If they had taught me the true history behind the three-fifths clause, then I would have understood the very good reason why it was written in such a fashion. The three-fifths clause is found in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution. And it says that representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. During the Constitutional Convention, there was a heated debate discussing how to count the population in order to appoint representation in Congress and in order to issue taxation. From the pro-slavery state's point of view, it would have been beneficial to count slaves into the population so that they would have greater representation in Congress and therefore could dictate the political influence in legislation making. The anti-slavery states saw that as extremely dangerous and opposed their position with the clause that tied taxation to the representation so that every person, including the people enslaved at the time, would hold some weight in the amount of tax owed by each state. And that was not as favorable to the slave states because, of course, no one wants to pay more in taxes. What's extremely sad is that the slave states wanted to include the slaves in the census in order to have greater representation in Congress, but they were not willing to give the slaves a vote and thereby plan to manipulate the political ideology filtered through Congress. Slave trade opponents saw clearly that allowing for slaves to be counted in the census would only incentivize more and more importation of slaves into America. It would also incentivize those states to lie about their population just to have a greater stronghold in Congress. So if slavery opponents had allowed for this to be pushed through without tying taxation to the representation, slavery would have become dangerously prominent in our nation. On the flip side, in states where slavery was not allowed, they had the benefit of being taxed less because their population size did not incorporate the slave population. Do you see how genius this really was? If there had not been the penalty of taxation tied to the incorporation of slaves into the census, southern states would have gone crazy importing as many slaves as they could just so that they could have the upper hand in our government. The taxation penalty to the states supporting slavery was, on the flip side, a benefit to the states in opposition to slavery because they did not have to worry about the tax burden that would come from having an abundant population size due to the slave populace. And again, I want to reiterate the fact that the majority was in opposition to the slave trade. 
Remember, the delegates were trying to tiptoe around very sensitive topics that could have blown up in their face, casting off freedom and the chance to have liberty for all indefinitely. In the Federalist Number 54, James Madison gave an interesting argument regarding this topic. Madison noted that the handful of pro-slavery individuals who were in support of incorporating slaves in representation were the very ones who tried to claim that those slaves were not human, but were rather property. And what Madison said in return was that, well, why should you be able to incorporate your slaves into representation when representation is specifically designated to include people and not property? How is it that they are people when it benefits you and property when it doesn't? Therefore, is it not right that you would just be delegated taxes for incorporating them into your population size? And it was on that point that Madison established a stronghold with his argument. Because finally, he had pinned the slavery proponents and essentially placed them in a predicament where they had to acknowledge slaves as being people and not property. In the Federalist Number 54, Madison says, Would the convention have been impartial or consistent if they had rejected the slaves from the list of inhabitants when the shares of representation were to be calculated and inserted them on the list when the tariff of contributions was to be adjusted? Could it be reasonably expected that the southern states would concur in a system which considered their slaves in some degree as men when burdens were to be imposed, but refused to consider them in the same light when advantages were to be conferred? It may be replied, perhaps the slaves are not included in the estimate of representatives in any of the states possessing them. They neither vote themselves nor increase the vote of their masters. Upon what principle then ought they to be taken into the federal estimate of representation? In this portion of the Federalist Papers, Madison is playing into the argument solely to poke holes into the foundation of their claims. And later he concludes, The establishment of a common measure for representation and taxation will have a very salutary effect. As the accuracy of the census to be obtained by the Congress will necessarily depend and a considerable degree on the disposition, if not on the cooperation, of the states, it is of great importance that the state should feel as little bias as possible to swell or to reduce the amount of their numbers. Were their share of representation alone to be governed by this rule, they would have an interest in exaggerating their inhabitants. Were the rule to decide their share of taxation alone, a contrary temptation would prevail. By extending the rule to both objectives, the states will have opposite interests, which will control and balance each other and produce the requisite impartiality. All of this is just another example of how our nation made great attempts to establish principles that would be fundamentally founded upon a checks and balance system to regulate power. The examples that I gave were tactics used in order to slow slavery until the year of 1808, where something could finally be done constitutionally. And that leads me to bring up Thomas Jefferson once again. You know, he was president during the year that the clause of 1808 was set to expire. And did you know that on January 1st, 1808, which was the very first opportunity for anything to be done constitutionally, Congress passed a bill to ban the importation of slaves in America and handed the bill over to President Thomas Jefferson to be signed into effect. The moment that Thomas Jefferson received the bill, it was signed into law. Thomas Jefferson was on the ball when it came to casting out the slave trade in the United States of America. For a man who was portrayed as being a lover of slavery, his actions do not fit the description. The fight did not end there, though. America is the only nation to host a war where citizens fought one another in order to abolish slavery. In no other nation has that been done. And even as the Civil War approached, our nation's leaders understood what the Bible had to say about God's judgment upon the nations. They knew that in Exodus 21 verse 16, it says that he who kidnaps a man whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. 
and to disobey this command would result in judgment upon the nation. One of the scriptural accounts to explain this point can be found in Exodus 5. It was here in scripture where God commanded Moses to go to Pharaoh and petition him to let the people of God go. And this time in history, Israel had been enslaved by Egypt and God said in Exodus 3 verse 7, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. The Lord commissioned Moses to be brave and go before the Egyptian government to declare the Lord's command and petition them to obey. When I was reading this portion of scripture, I reflected on the Constitutional Convention I thought about how God gave multiple chances to Pharaoh to let the slaves go free before he inflicted judgment upon them. And then I thought about how God gave America many chances to repent in all areas of our shortcomings. In particular, God used the anti-slavery delegates at the Constitutional Convention to entreat that the slaves be let free. Many of those delegates understood that national accountability to God was inevitable in any course of action. The thing is, nations must be judged here on earth because national judgment is not reserved for eternal life. George Mason, a Virginia delegate, said, As nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, so they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, providence pushes national sin by national calamities. By the time the Civil War began in America, it was made clear to many that the war outbreak was a result of disobedience to the commands of the Lord. The Civil War was God's judgment on the nation, just as in Obadiah 1.15. It says, For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near, As you have done it, it shall be done to you. In every biblical account of a nation falling short of the Lord's command, he is always faithful to send a source of conviction, and he always provides an opportunity for repentance. So, was America founded on slavery? Were our founders really so bent on continuing the slave practice that they were willing to sacrifice everything to keep it going? No and no. America was not founded on slavery. It was founded during a time when slavery was prominent and already well established in the colonies because of the force of the British government. To be founded upon means that it is your foundation and it is what you stand firm upon. But a large majority of our population during the time of the 1700s to 1860s had strong convictions that slavery had to be done away with if America was to be blessed by the Lord. Our founders were not bent on continuing the practice because instead of being willing to sacrifice everything to keep it going, they were willing to sacrifice everything to do away with it. Like I said, No other nation has allowed for a war to take place amongst its own people in order to do away with an evil. We cannot forget this truth because if we do, we will fall into the pit of lies that is sold by the mainstream media and educational systems today. Instead of feeling guilty for being an American citizen, I'm honored to know that in a time where our founders could have easily just turned the other way and continued going about their daily lives while innocent men and women suffered in bondage to slavery, a vast majority of our founding fathers stood up and spoke out on behalf of those without a voice so that centuries later those in bondage would enjoy the blessings of liberty so that they and their posterity could partake in the equality of opportunity, leaving the outcome to the Lord, because that is the American way. I hope you have enjoyed this episode because I certainly enjoyed researching all of this information to present to you. I would highly encourage you to go and research these things in your own time, and please be a steward of the word and share what you learn with those around you. If more and more people awaken to the truth, this nation could certainly experience a renewal that is much needed. I thank you so much for tuning in today, and I hope you have a blessed day.